and love. Please stand.
Judah, author of life, God of Israel, we come today, our hearts full of sorrow for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. We come asking for your power and might to be displayed, to comfort those who mourn, to give strength to those who are weak, courage to those faint of heart, and blessings to those who call upon your name. As the deacons prepare to take up our offering, I wanted to share this with you. Just as Jesus prayed over the loaves and fishes, which then were multiplied, we pray that God will multiply our <coughs> offerings that we bring so that his word will reach many people. We also pray for humility as we give so that our giving does not become a badge of honor, but a private conversation between us and God. Will the deacons come forward?
cards. We have a clock. Now, you know what? You weren't here, but these guys were. And what have we been talking about? We've been talking about Jesus, haven't we? And we've been talking about his return, and it tells us that no one's going to know the day or the hour, so we need to what? Be prepared. That's right. Because if we're not prepared, if we've not asked Jesus in our heart, are we going to get to go to heaven? No. Well, this is interesting that you picked the letter. Because it's called at the midnight cry, but we are living in the 11th hour right now. So, can you point to which one is the 11th? You want to flip it over? You want to flip it over? All right. So, what was that a picture of? That's a picture of Jesus. And Jesus is with us definitely at the 11th hour, isn't he? We're going to put that right there. Now, I had made a prediction before we ever even started. And the prediction I made was you were going to pick that card. Now, here's the cool thing. Because we're not in the 11th hour, who else has ruled the day? You want to start flipping over the cards? Flip over the cards. Oh, so what do we got? We got Satan and Satan and Satan and Satan and Satan and Satan. Keep flipping. We got Satan and Satan. <laughs> all right, so we have all three. Now, guess what? All three of it. You want to look through those? What do we got there? They're all Satan. <laughs> so out of all the cards that you could have picked, because I didn't influence you, did I? No, because I think they picked eight at the last one. You picked the one that Jesus was born over. And guess what? I knew you were going to, because I've had you in Sunday school in the youth group, and I know that you've accepted Christ in your heart, and I know you've accepted him in yours. And that's all we need to know, because it doesn't matter how many places Satan is in this world, we only need to know that Jesus is still born over that guy. Why don't you back Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you sent your Son to us to be the Lord over our lives. And we thank you that you make us ready. And when we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we will be ready no matter what time, no matter what hour, no matter what minute, that he comes to take us with him. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. You can go back. Actually, you're probably going to go down to Sunday school. Well, today we're going to be looking out a bunch of different scriptures that show us who God is really Lord over and who he has chosen. Now, I will go ahead and do a little disclaimer. We switch things up a little. It may run a little late today, but when I was worried about that at the Presbyterian Church, I got a stern look and said, don't you dare shorten that. <laughs> so, if you're upset that it goes a little longer, you talk to them. Because they're like, you need to say all of this. So we're going to be looking at Israel. So from Deuteronomy 20, 32, verses 7 through 15, he says, Remember the days of long ago. Ask your fathers and aged men. They will tell you all about it. When God divided up the world among the nations, he gave each of them a supervising angel. But he appointed none for Israel, for God, Israel was God's own personal possession. God protected them in the howling wilderness as though they were the apple of his eye. He spread his wings over them, even as eagles overspreads her young. She carries them upon her wings, as does the Lord his people. And when the Lord alone was leading them, and they lived without foreign gods, God gave them fertile hilltops, rolling fertile fields, honey from the rock, and olive oil from the stony ground. He gave them milk and meat and choice Bashan rams and goats and the finest of wheat. They drank the sparkling wine. But Israel was soon overfed, yes, fat and bloated, and then in plenty they forsook their God. They shrunk away the rock of their salvation. And from Romans 9, 4 through 5, God has given you so much, but still you will not listen to him. He took you as his own special people, chosen people, and led you among with a bright cloud of glory, and told you how very much he wanted to bless you. He gave you his rules for daily life so you would know what he wanted you to do. He let you worship him and gave you many promises. 
Great men of God were your fathers, and Christ himself was one of you, a Jew so far as his human nature was concerned. He who now rules over all things, praise God forever. Well, I, I know we've been doing a study on James, but I really felt like we needed to talk about Israel. It's in all the news. Everybody's wondering, and there's a lot of information out there. Unfortunately, not a lot of it is accurate. <laughs> and so we're going to look at what's going on and how this looks through the lens of Scripture and God's promise. So that's why I titled it, Help Me Understand, because that's what a lot of people are saying right now. Well, I threw up just a couple maps here. If you've ever looked at a globe, this is the whole eastern side of the world. <laughs> You have China here, you have Russia, this whole big area here, you've got India, this is Saudi Arabia, and it's even is Israel. There's a little more of a close-up. This little bitty red spot is Israel. So when you start hearing about this whole thing about squabbling over land, we're going to get into that a little bit. So even more close-up, this is what Israel looks like. Now, Here's the other thing. Well, it goes from the tip of Elah all the way up to the Golan Heights, which is right by Lebanon. You have the Gaza Strip, is what everyone's talking about right now. But this is all the Western Bank. When we were over in Israel, you could only go in this itty bitty little narrow bit <laughs> because otherwise it is all occupied by Palestinians. In fact, when we were right over here in Hebron, we were literally walking against the fence of Palestine. And normally, you wouldn't be able to do that. But we did, and thankfully we did when we did, because you wouldn't now. And when we were up here in the Golan Heights, which is where Gilgal Raphaim was, and then uh, Mount Hermon, we were literally on the, the Lebanon and the Syria border. Now, when we were there, there was a shot, a rocket fired from Lebanon, but it was shot down in the air. But we were literally on the border. So you have to realize that when you hear about all this stuff, and where they came in from Gaza, they came in through the, the Mediterranean. It's literally right there. There is no place for Israel to go. It is a buffer country. And that's why it has been fought over for so many years, for so, I mean, throughout all the thousands of years, because people have to go through Israel to get to the other places. So what I was getting at is this little bitty strip is basically all you can drive through safely. So in the West Bank over here is where Samaria is. And when we went to Mount Kabir, we were in armored bus. And we were able to go up on that mountain. And we could look down at Samaria, but we couldn't go into Samaria because of the threat from skirmishes with Palestine. And just to the side of us was Mount Ebal. Mount Ebal is where Joshua's altar is at. And we could not go up there because they did not have enough people for military escort. Why was Mount Ebal such a big deal? Because that's where Joshua's altar is at. They have excavated this entire altar. Why is that a big deal? Because that is the only true proof that has been completely excavated to show that the Israelites own that ground, that everything in the Bible is 100% true. Guess what happened about a month ago? Palestinians came in with bulldozers and they were trying to bulldoze down Joshua's altar. Now, Aaron Lipkin, who is the head of our tour agency that's over there, he came up and discovered the footprints of God. There's seven of them in Israel. But he's the one that found Joshua's altar. And so he was petitioning in Israel and he was petitioning everyone in America to call your congressman and your, your legislative people to call to save Joshua's altar. And because of all that, the they had to stop, <laughs> and they need to claim that as a historic landmark, so that way it should have already been, but I don't know what they have to do legally, to keep them from destroying this huge, huge piece of evidence. And Joshua's altar is when God brought the Israelites into the promised land, it was there that he built the altar to God. So this just kind of gives you an idea what we're talking about. This little bitty area right now is what everyone has fought over. And in Psalms 135, we did this for the call to worship, but he says, For the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own. Israel is to be his treasured possession. I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is greater than all the gods. Now, I know I've talked about a lot of this, but these where the scriptures are from. 
is it that God appointed an angel over every nation but Israel? Now, we talk about the fallen realm. What happened? Because some of those angels wanted to worship upon themselves. They wanted to trump God. And that's where we end up with all this problem. But God is the God of Israel. He is the God of all gods. It says the Lord does whatever he pleases him in the heavens and on earth and in the seas and all their debts. And he gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his people Israel. It is an inheritance that cannot be taken away. It is theirs. It is their rightful land grant. And from Exodus 6 or 7, he says, And I will accept them as my people, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am Jehovah their God who has rescued them from the Egyptians. So, just give them a little history here. We've talked about this. Where does this whole skirmish come from? The entire Arab nations come from one man. Do you know who that is? It's Ishmael. That sounds familiar. That's because Abraham, when God called Abraham, and he said, I'm going to make from you a great nation, and I will give you a child. Well, he got restless, and so did Sarah. She had other alternatives. <laughs> but she gives Hagar, her maid servant, to, to Abraham, and he has Ishmael, the older son. And God says, no, he is not the one. I am going to put the inheritance through your next son, Isaac. But I will make a great nation out of Ishmael. All of the entire Arabic nations come from Ishmael. All the Jews, and pretty much everybody else, comes from Isaac. Now here's where we get into problem. Moses wrote this account of Abraham and God, and Isaac and Ishmael, 1400 B.C., okay? Set in stone, on Mount Moriah, Abraham sacrificed, went to sacrifice Isaac. The problem was Mohammed comes along in 600 AD, this is way after Christ, 2,000 years later, and he says, no, 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 it wasn't Isaac, it was Ishmael that Abraham took to Mount Moriah and was going to sacrifice. Uh -huh. And hence, the fighting. Now, before that, about 500 years before that, in AD, you may say, so where does all this come from? Rome, imagine that. <laughs> Rome had come in and they had possessed Israel, right? They had kind of taken over and they were running the show. And it was in 135 AD, that this is after the temple had been destroyed in 70 AD, that the Jews did an uprising, kind of like the Maccabees. They tried to get rid of Rome and they had this big uprising and they went to charge and Hadrian, who was the emperor at the time, squelched it. And to eradicate the Jews, he even took away their name, Israel, and he called it Palestinia, after the Philistines. Hence, where we get the name Palestine. So that didn't even come about until 135. <coughs> so for that entire time, we're talking almost 2,000 years, Israel did not exist as a nation anymore. The people existed, but Israel did not. We're going to look, as we continue to go, the different people throughout scriptures that have tried to completely annihilate the Jewish people. But in 1947, the United Nations made a partition, a land, because the Jews were living in Israel, but they made a partition for land for both the Palestinians and the Jews. Gaza is part of Israel. But it was the United Nations that gave it to Palestine. The Philistines had actually, we're talking David Goliath, you remember the Philistines? They had inhabited that area. So this partition was made, it's only 25 miles long and 7 miles wide. As I said, Israel is so small, if you think of the state of New Jersey, that's the size of the country. The West Bank is part of Israel, and yet that has been occupied by the Palestinians. Unfortunately though, now, I'm not saying anything bad against the Palestinians, because the Jews and the Muslims get along quite well in Israel, but there's a radical group called Hamas, just like Al-Qaeda. It's a terroristic group. So it'd be just like saying that not all Mexicans are bad down in Mexico, it's the cartel that's bad. That's kind of the same thing that's going on here. Now, the Jews back in 1947, they accepted this partition. 
But the Palestinians rejected it. And what was the issue? They did not want the Jews anywhere around. They wanted them annihilated. It had nothing to do with how much ground. Now, it wasn't until 1948 that something major happens, and what? That's when the United Nations acknowledges Israel and makes them a nation again. Now, if you ever read Ezekiel, Ezekiel talks about the valley of the dry bones. Some would argue that that's the one zombie apocalypse that's mentioned in the Bible. But the valley of the dry bones is this prophecy. It's when, they, when Israel was going to become and resurrected again as a nation. And all those thousands of years later, it happens. Now, just to kind of give you an idea, and I'm, I'm giving you these facts because you're going to hear different things on the news. Israel's bad. They're taking away what little bit of ground the Palestinians have. Okay. The Arabs possess 300 times more land than Israel. And over 40 times more of the population. Yet they will not recognize the existence of the Jews. And this goes way back through Scripture. Now, this is another interesting little tidbit because, as I showed you on that map, Negev was at the bottom. That is barren, that's desert, it's wasteland, it's a wilderness, it's below the Dead Sea. There's nothing there but rock and nothing really grows too much. That's where the Jews had been residing before. That was the little part that they had been contained to. Guess where the attack happened? In the Negev area. When those air gliders came in and hit the concert that was going on. It was in the Gev. There's also another correlation. Once they hit those 250 young people and killed them, they took the women and did unspeakable things to them and live streamed the whole thing. And then they went village by village. And who were they hitting? They were hitting the old. They were hitting the babies. They were hitting the women. They were hitting the defenseless. We're going to see that in history, this exact thing had happened before in the exact same region. Well, back in 1947, it was Britain who gave in Israel 187,500 acres of land to be cultivated by the Arabs. <laughs> that was all the good stuff. And they gave 4,200 acres to the Jews. Now, this is the other thing. The Jews did not ever steal that land, even though it was theirs. They had to buy it back, piece by piece, from the earth. What happened in 1948? They had the big six-day war, and this was God's hand, but the Arabs got scared, and they got up, and they ran, and they left. Now, the Jews didn't just take it over. They literally bought that land at an exorbitant price of $1,000 an acre. But piece by piece, acre by acre, they bought their land back. Right now, currently in Israel, 20% living are Palestinians. That means one in every five, and they have voting rights. Well, so we've looked at peace treaties, and how many here have heard the Abraham Accords? That was the big thing a few years ago. Right now, there was the big peace treaty that was supposed to be happening between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Actually, it's not the king of Saudi Arabia, but his son, who's going to be taking over, that has been pushing for this. He's been pushing for modernization and the benefits of being in this peace treaty. But now, since this attack happened, the king, and of course, being an Arab sympathizer, of course, because he is, <laughs> has pulled back from that. Well, that's not the only peace treaty. It first started in 1979 with Egypt. And then there was one in 1994 with Jordan, which is right beside Israel, and now with Saudi Arabia. All these peace agreements are actual markers, and they are talked about in the scriptures. There's going to be another big peace treaty that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen until the seven years of tribulation when the Antichrist comes on the scene. And that's what makes him so popular. He's going to come in offering this unbelievable peace deal. And halfway through the midpoint of that, three and a half years, he's going to break that agreement. And that's when everything goes south. So it's going to be a false peace. Now, why, you may say, all right, it was started out at 200. We're now up to 1,500 people. 
have been killed. And you may say, well, that's 1,500. Do you realize that since Israel, that was the worst number of casualties since the Holocaust? I mean, it's in no comparison to the Holocaust, but it's the worst since then. I mean, they were even, it's just unthinkable what they were doing to the babies and to the people. And, and now you have to worry about Hezbollah from the north. But all this is being funded by Iran to the tune of over $100 billion a year for multiple years. We're going to look at Iran and where they actually fit into all of this. Now, the problem is, this is where the propaganda comes in. Because since Israel's been attacked, they have no choice but to what? Go in, find the hostages. You have to realize, Israel did not take hostages. Hamas took hostages. They're going to get their people back. And they're looking for those radical terrorists. We did the same thing with Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq. But the way the news is portraying it is Israel's evil and Israel's bad. They have not been showing hardly any footage at all of what happened in Israel. But there's going to be casualties in the Gaza Strip. And why? Because Hamas, Americans, and Israel value life. We will choose life over anything. Hamas does the opposite. They don't just want to be martyred. That's when you get your rewards. And it's not just martyring yourself. It's how many people you can take with you. You can't, <laughs> you can't reason with that. And they use their own people as human shields. It's, it's going to be bad. But I just want you to think of that when you watch these images or you hear the things on the news. Um, look at it through the lens of scripture and truth. As I said, the Golan Heights is close to Lebanon, and they've had rockets in Jerusalem. My Hebrew teacher is actually in Jerusalem. He used to be in Haifa, and he moved down to Jerusalem. Believe it or not, he's actually a, a Nebraskan boy from the western part of the state. He's been in Israel now for about 15, 16 years. And when the sirens go off, he said, you have 30 seconds. I want you to think about this. Everybody has a bomb shoulder in their house. They have to. It's by regulation. But when the siren goes off, you have 30 seconds to get to shelter. That's not very much time <laughs> if you're outside. Now, they have what's called the Iron Dome. Have you heard of that? And David Slain. Who here remembers when Reagan was president and he was trying to push Star Wars? Remember what Star Wars was? It's the exact same thing that the Iron Dome, what that is. When somebody shoots a rocket, this Iron Dome shoots the rocket and blows it up before it can hit. Problem was, they think that this was really much a test. So, it's a hypothetical. Let's say that the Iron Dome can handle 30 rockets at one time. They shot 35. What's going to happen? Five are going to get through. And some of them were duds on purpose to take some of those other rockets out of the way. Here's the thing, though. Besides the one that hit west of Bethlehem, they hit their own big mosque in the gosh. The sad thing is that area is very peaceful. The Jews and the Arabs get along just fine. And it's sad that after that happened, now you see little kids that they're interviewing, both Israeli and Arab, talking about shooting each other now because of this. Ones that were friends just a week ago. Now here's another one. So after they were live streaming this horrific chaos going on, they were celebrating in Gaza. They were handing out candy and presents that they had killed women and children. This is not only is this the embodiment of evil, but guess what? This is a foreshadowing of what's to happen in the book of Revelation. And we're going to get into that coming up. If you have read, how many have ever read the book of Revelation? A lot of people steer clear, but you need to read it. I said that midway point, the three and a half years, when the Antichrist breaks the peace deal, things go south. God sends two witnesses. One Moses, and the other one, they think Elijah. And they are witnessing to who? to the Jewish people, that Christ is the Messiah. He's getting them ready. And they're witnessing, now here's the thing, the Antichrist and his troops do everything they can to kill these two witnesses, because they hate them, <laughs> saying everything they don't want to hear, but they can't. Anybody who gets close, the fire and breath of God disintegrates them. 
And so for almost three and a half years, nobody can touch them. They have to listen to what they're witnessing to. So towards the very end, God allows at a certain point for them to be able to kill these two witnesses. And when they do, they raise their bodies up in the, in the streets and they start celebrating and they start handing out candy and presents. It's just like Christmas. And then three days later, guess what happens? God raises them from the dead. Do you see the parallels of what is going on and what either has been or what's coming? Now, I talked about Iran because Iran is the head of the Islamic Republic. But for many of you, you may know that in biblical times, it's known as what? Persia. Now, the Persians actually are not happy with the Islamic Republic. But 10 years ago, Netanyahu was told by God that he was to go in and he was to put a stop to what Iran was doing and the nuclear weapons that they were creating in the bio-warfare. And he would have done it except he was talked out of it by a certain person. And that was Obama. And that's kind of where we're at now with this nuclear threat that's still going on. But I want to get into the holidays. We've been talking about the holidays. The first holiday for the Jewish feast is what? Passover. And that starts on the 14th day of Nisan. That's when God passed over when they put the blood over the doorposts. That was God's redemption. But we've talked a lot about the numbers and the letters and how they correlate and what they mean. We looked at that with the Jewish New Year. 14 is talking about hand, right? And in Hebrew it means God redeems with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He redeemed Israel on Passover. It ends at the end of those Jewish celebrations on the 14th of Adar, which is the last month. So we go through Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur and the Tabernacles. And Yom Kippur, right after that, is Purim. Who here knows what Purim is? We've talked about it. Did a series on it. Esther. When Esther, this is, where was she set? Where's that whole story set at? In Persia, which is Iran. Her and Mordecai, he finds out that the plot is to what? Annihilate the Jews by Haman. Remember that story. Who is Haman? Gotta go back through the lineage. King Agag. God told Saul, wipe him out because he's an Amalek. And they wanted to eradicate the Jews. And Saul did not. And who comes from King Agag? But Haman. Haman, what was his one whole goal? To eradicate the Jews. And it was because of Esther and Mordecai that they were allowed to fight back and God saved them. And so they celebrate that on the day of Purim. <laughs> Which is, like I said, the 14th day of the month. Persia is going to rise again in the scriptures. There is going to be another Haman that will arise called the Assyrian. Now I know we talk about the Antichrist. Did you know he's only mentioned that once in the Bible? He has been given a title multiple times elsewhere. And he is called the Assyrian. That tells us where he's coming from, doesn't it? It's going to come on the scene. Did you know that Iran calls us little Israel? U.S. I have said all along that America was the promised land, the next promised land, because where did all the Jews go during the Holocaust? To America. Did you know we have more percentage of Jews living in America than lives in Israel? And that's why God says, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who curse Israel. I said uh, Amalek is yeah, the eye guide, and that actually comes from Esau. But what did he do? He attacked the women. He attacked the children. He attacked the old. It was defenseless. <laughs> See the cycle? It's that seed in Genesis 
three, we start out. The seed of the serpent will be at an enmity with the seed of the woman. Throughout this entire time, it's been the seed of the two. Did you know there was one other person in the middle that's actually from this lineage? Can you think who it might be? Hitler. And what did he try to do? He tried to eradicate all the Jews. Well, Israel is mentioned over 2,000 times in the Bible. 70 just in the New Testament. They are God's chosen people. It's about prophecy. It's about God chose Abraham and made him a non-conditional covenant, a land grant that we read about to all the generations. And we know if you've read your Bible, they don't lose the land. When they are trying for all these centuries to get rid of that land, and even just since I've been around, how many presidents have gone and tried to make them give part of their land away? It will never happen because the scriptures say it will never happen. You know, even the, the rabbis believe that everything in the Bible, everything that's going on is in the Bible. And even Hamas is talked about, which is interesting. I don't know if you realize the very first mention of the word Hamas was all the way back to Genesis 6. Before Noah. It says God sees that there is Hamas, which means great beyond evil. Such evil to the core that it is not redeemable. And God's heart is grieved. And what does Jesus say? In the days of Noah, there will be when the Son of Man returns. What is it going to be? Hamas. <laughs> Many violence against the Jews. Of course, there's other things in there too, but that's just interesting. Even the book of Obadiah, God says he will judge the descendants of Esau, Hamas rejoicing at the death of the Jews in the, from the Babylonians. This has been an ongoing theme throughout all of the scriptures. Uh, Bill Koenig says, hmm, talk about other coincidences. That particular day, there was no Israeli intelligence. Do you know that when they attacked, that it was the not just Yom Kippur, but it was the Jubilee of Yom Kippur. It was the 50th anniversary of the last time that Hamas did a horrific attack on Israel. 50 years. It should have been kind of a, you know, radar. Maybe something happened. They had no intelligence, and yet Egypt comes out and says they told them three days prior. Here's another thing. The Iron Dome was not working at the beginning when they attacked. The Iron Dome always works. Why did it not attack? I see the parallel with 9-11 in January 6th. What happened in 9-11? They sent all of our security home. And our intelligence wasn't working. January 6th, what did they do? They sent all the police on him. We had no intelligence. There's just parallels. So, there's been almost 1,500 Israelis killed. And we said, what does that look like? That may seem like, well, 13 or 1,500. But the percentage of population there compared to here, if we were to put it in terms, that would be like losing 70,000 people right here in America. We lost 3,000 during 9-11, and look what it did to our world, our country. That would be comparison to 70,000. The problem is, if you've been turning on the TV, what are you seeing? You're seeing protests, even some getting very violent in riots. And what are they protesting? Anti-Semitism, right? They're protesting, it's all for Palestine and the Palestinians. The difference is you can protest, right? But they're doing it by screaming and yelling, and the hatred is just oozing through. And yet that's what we're seeing. And that is the spirit of evil that is being propagated to the world. Elon Musk, um, he, Elon Musk, he took over Twitter, he calls it now the X. And it's interesting, because when he took it over, he dissembled it, and he, he wanted to make it more of an open forum so it didn't have all the, the barriers to it. However, he was not planning on this. <laughs> In just one short few days, 
he could not keep up with the 15 million anti-Semitic content, graphic media, violent speech, hateful conduct about, conduct about the Israeli-Hamas war. You have to realize it's open worldwide. If Hamas has 40% more population than even Israel, who do you think is doing the most Twitter? Yeah. So there is a shift. We're never going to be going back. Just like 9 11. It's, it's not going to go back. Israel has been changed forever along with the Middle East. And this is good. Biden came out in support of everything. And he said, in fact, I was just looking that right now our SEALs Team 6 hit the ground last night and is helping fight the war. But I love the little things that God does. The Apple, the aircraft carrier that was in the Mediterranean at that moment, the first ones to respond, guess what the name of it is? The Noah. <laughs> As in the days of Noah. <laughs> The Bible repeatedly affirms that Israel is the only nation that God has ever created. There's never been another nation formed by God himself. In fact, Israel's existence is a testimony to God's existence. Like I said, it had gone from 137 AD until 1948. Yet God is faithful. And this itty bitty nation, he could have picked any nation. Good grief, Russia has the biggest landmass. United States, China. Nope. He picked itty bitty little Israel. And what country is the most fought over? An itty bitty little country. <laughs> the survival of the people of Israel is proof that God's active providence in the lives of his people. And that's from um, Jimmy Evans and Tipping Point. So, what is coming for Israel, as I said, is a counterfeit peace. It's going to be coming from the Antichrist. Um, which leads up to the Ezekiel 38 war. Interesting thing here is that in Jeremiah, it talks about the Jeremiah 29 war. And that's the one with Iran. And that happens before Ezekiel. So Iran needs to watch themselves, because if we're going by scripture, uh, <laughs> they don't get to last that long. Also, we know that in this whole scrimmage, Putin's gotten on board, China's gotten on board, Korea's gotten on board. Who does it talk about in Revelation at the end? The kings from the north, Russia, the king from the east, China, and the king from the south, Iran. All coming up <coughs> against Israel. But here's the thing. God is the one true God, and he is the calm and the peace in the storm. Jesus, knowing all this, said that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Men would rise up against one another, but he said what? Take heart, for I have overcome the world. So do not fall for the propaganda that you see going on on TV or in the news. Do your homework. Follow trusted sources. And watch the events that are unfolding through the lens of the scripture. And most importantly, through the lens of prayer. And I'm going to leave you with this. It's the prayer from Isaiah 41.10. He says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is the hope. That is what we cling to. That the God we serve is ultimately in control. And when this whole thing is done, he will bring beauty from ashes. Amen. So we come to our time of prayer. I know that there are many right now in need of a lot of prayer. Kind of seems like sometimes when these wars, when you get blindsided and everything starts hitting, it all comes at once. Do we have those that we would like to lift up? Okay, if you bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we know that there are so many that are in need of your healing. 
those who have been in traumatic events, those who have been in accidents that have left them not only maybe physically damaged, but emotionally damaged as well. We pray that you would be a comfort and a peace. We pray for those who are suffering with all different illnesses, those that seem to just keep coming and coming and coming. You are the God that can eradicate the plagues, and we ask that you would put your protection and healing over them. Dear Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Israel and around the world and our military forces that are joining. We ask that you would be with them and um, help them make sense of all of this. Make their eyes alert. Put a protection around your people and your nation. And dear Lord, thank you for showing us that this is not new. It is cyclical. There have been so many times throughout all of history, throughout all of the scriptures, that the world, that the enemy, that Satan has tried to obliterate your people and your name, and yet you still will prevail. Thank you for those words of assurances, and thank you for letting us know that you are ultimately in control, even till the end of the last line, in Revelation. And we thank you that your son came as that Messiah to both us and your Jewish nation. And we thank you on those times when we are left without words, searching and seeking and asking, that he even gave us a prayer that we can pray to you. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, how it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for us. As we come before Christ's table, we come all invited, all who accept him as Lord and Savior are beckoned to come. To come remembering the night in which he sat with his twelve closest and he lifted up the loaf and he gave thanks and he blessed it to God Almighty, King of the Universe. And he broke it and he said, this is now going to be my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up the cup, the cup of salvation, and he said, this is now going to be a new covenant, a covenant between myself and you. It's going to be my blood that will be poured out for the forgiveness of all of the horrific sin in the world, the past, present, and future. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so as the body of Christ, we come before his feast, eating and drinking, remembering his death and his resurrection, but proclaiming to all that we are in the eleventh hour, and he is coming in. If you would join with me in our next hymn, page 217, there is a redeemer.
please bow your head with me. In our attitudes, in our actions, in our desires, and in our fears, we are like sheep who have strayed far from the green pastures and still waters. We cry out in our need, and because you are the good shepherd, you hear us, seek us out, and rescue us in the scattered places to which we have wandered. The bread we now break is the symbol of your shepherd's care, for you feed us, you guard us, you protect us, you seek and find us through Jesus Christ. Dedicate us to your will as we partake in this bread of communion, that we may truly be the sheep of your pasture, responding to the needs of the world around us, as we have, as you have responded to ours, we pray to you in Christ's holy name. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Your love lasts longer than the mountains. Your compassion is vaster than the galaxies of space. The cup we now lift for your blessing is a sign of your compassion, for it reminds us that the lifeblood of Jesus Christ was poured out for us. As we drink from this cup, we remember that because Christ died, we live. Although we remember Christ's death, we worship a living Christ who provides us our needs. Um, we remember especially now the harvest season. Keep, in, keep all your servants safe and dedicate us to be your loving, serving people. Amen.
Thank you. 